Pollination is the transfer of pollen from the male part of the plant to the female part of a plant of the same species. The anthers, the male part of the flower, produce pollen. The pollen must be transferred to the upper female part of the flower, the stigma. Here, the pollen germinates and grows down the style to where fertilization occurs and the seed develops in the ovaries. A fruit is a ripened ovary. Usually, transfer of pollen occurs with the help of insects, birds, and bats, but gravity, wind, or water can also transport pollen. Pollination is needed to produce seeds and to ensure uniformly shaped fruits and vegetables. Many insects and animals visit flowers for the nectar and pollen reward that they provide. Plants produce the nectar and pollen as an attractant to get animals to come and visit and to help the pollination process. The insects are there to get the nectar, a carbohydrate reward, and pollen, a protein reward, and it helps them in their nutritional value. You'll see many insects and birds on plants. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are facilitating the pollination process. They are there to get that nectar and pollen reward. The diversity of insect pollinators is quite extensive and includes flies, butterflies, and moths and beetles. But bees are the primary pollinator of many fruits and vegetable plants. Without bees providing pollination, the number of fruit and vegetables would be much less. Bees are not necessary for the vegetable plants we eat, but they are necessary to produce the seeds to grow them. Bees are by far the most effective pollinators because of their hairy bodies, their ability to transfer pollen from one flower to the next. So they will have not only the ability to uh, fly to from flower to flower, but a means of carrying the pollen. On some bees, you'll see the corbiculum on the hind leg where they store the, the pollen. With other bees, they have hairy underbellies on their abdomen where they are able to transfer that pollen. Other insects don't have the hairy bodies and don't have that ability to transfer the pollen from one source to the other, and therefore they're not as good in terms of facilitating the pollination process. Honeybees are the perfect pollinator. Their hairy bodies, their ability to buzz helps facilitate the, the distribution of the pollen from the anthers uh, onto their bodies, and then they are able to fly from one flower to the next to transfer that pollen and have a receptive bit of pollen land on the stigma. Now there's a lot of pollen that can land on a stigma over the course of time, but it has to be a compatible variety of pollen. For instance, some plants are self-infertile. In other words, the pollen lands on the stigma, the pollen tube may grow, but the plant will abort that flower. Having the ability to get the pollen from a receptive flower onto the stigma of a compatible plant is extremely important and to allow that facilitation of that pollen tube to grow down, for the seeds to set, and for the fruit and the flesh to grow around that seed that helps with the transfer of that seed to a, some location. Having a nice, beautiful apple is an extremely important aspect of marketing. Well, bees not only facilitate the pollination, but having 10 seeds in that apple ensures a uniformly shaped apple that is far more marketable and able to uh, sell on the, the market at a higher price than a small apple. If you don't have complete set with, with apples, for example, you'll have one side of the apple larger than the other side, and it's just not good for in terms of marketability and having a solid good fruit. So ensuring that you have good pollinators not only helps with the, the seed set, but it also is important to having fruit that is marketable, that is enjoyable to eat, and is nutrition for you. It is also important that the pollinator has chewing and lapping mouthparts needed to consume and utilize the floral rewards. Pollen is the only natural source of protein for the bees. Bees see well into the ultraviolet range and are able to see patterns that are invisible to the human eye that leads them directly to the nectar or pollen reward. The plant uses these patterns to lead the bee on a path into the flower that will maximize the change for effective pollination. A good pollinator will also be relatively consistent in the type of flower they visit on any one trip, thus improving the chance of a pollen grain landing on the stigma of a compatible plant. So how important are bees for pollination? 
It's estimated that bees contribute 16 to 18 billion dollars to agriculture in terms of the pollination and pollination services they provide. It, it's estimated that, and often quoted, that bees are responsible for about one-third of the food we eat. Now that's a dramatic uh, number, but even more dramatic is the fact that out of the 120 different types of food groups, bees are responsible for 80 of them. So we're not going to starve if bees disappear. The wheat, for example, is self-pollinated. It's a perfect flower. Uh, rice, all those are, are self-pollinated and don't need bees for pollination services. But things like kiwis, uh, pears, plums, apples, uh, lots of your uh, seed for vegetables such as broccoli and cauliflower are all dependent on bees for pollination. So having bees really increases the diversity and the nutritional value of the food we eat and the affordability of the food we eat. Ten of the largest crops grown in Washington rely on bees for pollination. Having bees is essential. However, with certain crops, honeybees may not be the only or the best pollinator for that crop. Insects are important for pollinating many of our crops. In fact, honeybee, which is the main species of pollinator that we utilize in agriculture, is responsible for pollinating over 130 horticultural crops. Now in fruit production, which includes small fruits like our berry crops as well as tree fruits, they are very important and are utilized by growers so that they can get adequate fruit set as well as optimal berry quality. Now in blueberry, we have some unique challenges with respects to pollinating this crop. That's in part due to the fact that the bloom time of blueberry is very early and the weather typically is cool and not conducive for pollination by honeybee, and that is Apis mellifera, the species. As a result of that, there is research looking at alternatives to pollinators such as osmia, which includes the mason bees and leaf cutting bees, as well as bombus or the bumblebees. Now, the point of interest for these particular types of pollinators is that they may be utilized not solely for pollination, but synergistically with Apis mellifera, so that we can have supplementation and as a result, optimize on pollination and fruit set for this crop. Native bees are important pollinators of many of our crops and other flowering plants. Crop species that have been shown to be important for native bees and provide effective sources of nectar and pollen include strawberries, blueberries, other berry crops. Huckleberries is an important one in the Pacific Northwest, um, as well as crops such as melons and squash and tree fruits um, that are present um, either later in the season or early in the fall. Other crops such as um, many herb species are very attractive to native bees and provide those important nectar and pollen resources to help them get through the season. These include mints, oregano, lavender, and rosemary. Um, some annual species as well as perennials such as rosemary can provide that important diversity in colors and plant structures that are important for a lot of different species of native bees. Other landscaping plants such as goldenrod, um, lavender or other species are very important around the farm or garden or home for native bees. Man's relationship with bees dates back at least 10,000 years. Hunter-gatherers would find beehives in cave or tree cavities and harvest the honey for carbohydrates and the brood, larvae and pupae, for protein. About 1500 BC, Man found ways for bees to be kept in straw skep hives, logs, and clay pots, eliminating the need to find hives in the wild and a more predictable source of honey for mead or honey wine as a sweetener and for medicinal uses. Around 1851, the Reverend Lorenzo Lorraine Langstroth developed a new type of hive where you could remove the honeycomb from the colony and inspect each individually. Bees will not build comb in areas under a quarter of an inch wide and will build new comb or bridges of wax when a space is larger than 7 sixteenths of an inch. This simple discovery, known as bee space, revolutionized our understanding of bees and the beekeeping industry. The first commercial beekeeper in the United States was Moses Quinby, who kept 1,200 hives in upstate New York. The habitat for bees was so plentiful back then the beekeeper rarely needed to move their hives to find sufficient forage for honey production. Well, since Moses Quinby's time, 
the honeybee industry has changed dramatically. It is a multi-billion dollar business with bees being trucked throughout the United States to facilitate pollination services. In fact, most of the commercial beekeepers now don't make their money off of honey, but rather from pollination and pollination services. Eric Olson tells us about the kinds of beekeepers and how his pollination business works. Beekeepers in the world today are made up of two different types of beekeepers. You have um, uh, the pollinator who also makes honey, and you have the honey producer who also pollinates. And there's a vast difference in the two in that the pollinator is constantly pollinating every year and has got to have very strong colonies for pollination. So colony strength is a bigger issue for the pollinator, whereas the honey producer is trying to make as many hives as he can to produce as much honey as he can. So he tends to make more splits and more hives to increase his numbers. So that's how I differentiate between the two different kinds of beekeepers. Olson's Honey, we are um, uh, uh, basically pollinators. Uh, we're the first kind there in that we are pollinators and we do make some honey. Our, our reason for existence is pollination. Uh, honeybee pollination uh, is absolutely essential. Uh, one in every three bites of food that people eat in the world today, uh, the honeybee is directly responsible for pollinating that. So we pollinate Starting in January, we start pollinating in the almonds in California with our entire outfit. Uh, as soon as the almonds are over in March, we move everything home and we pollinate the tree fruits, uh, uh, cherries, peaches, pears, apples, all of the tree fruits. Our whole outfit goes into that in the central part of Washington state. Uh, and then the next step uh, in May, we come out of all the tree fruits and we begin pollinating uh, blueberries and blackberries. And then the next crop we go into is cranberries. Most people don't realize cranberries have to be pollinated. Uh, if you have no bees to pollinate the cranberries, you have no cranberries, period. Uh, and from the cranberries, our outfit moves into the seed pollination uh, uh, radish seed, coriander, uh, canola seed, onion seed, uh, carrot seed, uh, all of the different uh, seed crops. And then uh, as uh, August uh, approaches, we move into the buckwheat. Buckwheat has to be pollinated also. So that's some of the crops that we cover uh, uh, as pollinators. And, uh, and we make a little bit of honey on the side uh, while we're pollinating, but not a lot. The various crops take uh, different amounts of time to pollinate. With the almonds, we generally are in the almonds by the 10th of February, and we usually get out about the 10th to the 14th of March. So we're in almonds for about 30 days. Most crops are in that realm, with the exception of apples. When we pollinate apples, it is very interesting. Um, the growers of apples do not want to have to hand thin. So they watch very carefully and they, they keep track of their bee hours. And when they think they have a crop, bam, they want those bees out of there right now. And the most extreme case was about 15 years ago. I put the bees in one day and they called me and wanted them out the next day because we had one day of really good temperatures and they felt they had their crop and they didn't want any more. Um, the other side of that coin is when we have a cold year and the apples get frost damage, then the growers hang on to the bees forever. They keep hoping the bees will put more blossoms on because their blossoms have all been frozen. So those are the two extremes in apples. Uh, cranberries is generally uh, four to five weeks uh, the seed crops are anywhere from two to four weeks. Those are the time frames in the various crops. Today there are approximately 2.2 to 2.5 million beehives in the United States. The almond industry requires 1.6 to 2 million hives for facilitating pollination services every spring. So that means the vast majority of bees are put on semis and trucked from virtually every corner of the United States into California 
for almond pollination. Almonds are by far the biggest economic and motivator for beekeepers, with them receiving $200 per hive for three-week pollination services. Many bees are trucked from all over the country into the, that, for that three-week period from the last two weeks of February and the first week of March. Bees are absolutely essential for almond pollination. 99% of almond set is dependent on insects to facilitate that pollination process. The almond pollen is very heavy and needs bees to be able to transport from one flower to a compatible variety. Without bees, almonds would not be available. Once the almond pollination is over with at that three week period, all those 1.6 to 2 million bees need to be put on trucks and trucked out of the almond pollination so that the almond growers can then go in with their application of fungicides and other herbicides and to facilitate their overall production. Where do those bees go? Well, many of them go back down to Florida or to Texas for palmetto or orange blossom, or they come up into Oregon and Washington to facilitate cherry, pear, and apple pollination. This is an ongoing activity that beekeepers constantly moving their bees from one pollination service to the next. So after the apple pollination, they may go into summer seed production or they go in over to the Dakotas in Montana for summer honey production. Beekeepers can earn up to $200 per colony for having hives with 8 to 12 frames of bees for three weeks of rent, so it can be quite profitable. But besides pollination services and honey production, package bee and queen production are also important sources of revenue for the bee industry. Pollen, propolis, royal jelly, and venom are also collected and sold by beekeepers. Some cosmetics are made from bee products, too. So what is colony collapse disorder? First coined in 2006, describing the sudden disappearance of bees from the colony, leaving behind the eggs, larvae, and brood within the colony, but no live bees within that colony. Perhaps the queen was still there, but it was a sudden and surprising demise of the colony. This is really not a new phenomenon. We used to describe it as disappearing disease or absconding disease, where bees would suddenly disappear. But the precedent in 2006 and the elevated levels of this occurring was what caught everyone's attention. Researchers have identified more than 60 variables associated with colony collapse disorder, including pests, diseases, pesticides, stress, loss of habitat, and nutrition. But what is the definitive cause remains elusive. Most researchers and many beekeepers really attribute the primary cause of colony collapse disorder to the varroa mite. The varroa mite evolved with two Asian honeybees, Apis dorsata and Apis serrana, and adapted to the European honeybee many years ago, uh, Apis mellifera. It then migrated back into uh, Europe through shipment of queens and packages and eventually found its way to the United States in an environment where the bees have no natural defenses. The varroa mite has become a major pest of honeybees. We are not sure how the varroa mite was introduced, but it could have been introduced by smuggling in bees or accidentally on a container ship or may have migrated on the African honeybee or some other means of entry. It really doesn't matter at this point, as it is now virtually everywhere and is here to stay. Control of the varroa mite and understanding exactly what is causing the decline in honeybees has been a source of great frustration for beekeepers. Strong colonies of bees is absolutely essential for pollination. Growers pay a lot of money to have bees to pollinate and they want bees in the boxes. That's a huge challenge in this day and age. Everybody's heard about the bee losses in the world and what's happening. Uh, the first thing you have to do is you have to control varroa mite. Varroa mite is the number one reason for bee loss in the world today. Uh, the second thing is you have to feed and feed heavily. Uh, the environment is such that the bees have very little opportunity to collect uh, honey that they need to stay strong. For a beehive to be strong, you need three things. You need water, you need nectar, and you need pollen. All three things. Take any of those away, and the colony will go into a stress situation. They won't be as good a pollinators. 
Varroa mite is a significant problem for beekeepers and a primary factor in bee loss and poor colony health. How does this mite affect the bee and what are beekeepers doing to manage this pest? The Varroa mite pierces and su sucks out the hemolymph of the bee, introducing pathogens as it's doing that. So it has a dual effect, not only removing the hemolymph or the blood from the bee, but also introducing those pathogens, viruses, bacteria into the bee, pretty much causing major stress on the bees and its ability to survive. Without treatment, the beekeeper will lose the colony within two years once they have the infestation of the varroa mite. Because the beekeeper will lose that colony if they don't treat with something, beekeepers have been forced to use various chemicals in order to keep the varroa mite in check. As one beekeeper once told me, I can't make money off of dead bees. So they've adapted various types of approaches to controlling the varroa mite, including some softer chemicals, but also some harsher chemicals that have a tendency to stay in the colony for extended periods of time. Unfortunately, many of the chemicals that beekeepers have been using to control the mite are no longer effective. Part of the reason is the nature of wax sorbs onto that chemical and it persists in the colony for long periods of time. So some of the early chemicals that beekeepers were relying upon are no longer effective in control of the mite. As time has evolved, beekeepers have been forced to increase the dosage in order to get control of the mite. And that has caused significant problems within the bee industry itself in that we have very few chemicals available to control the mite. So we have to start looking at different approaches and different ways of controlling the mite and not just rely on chemical treatment. Wax is very absorbent and many of the chemicals beekeepers have used to control the mite persist in the colony for long periods of time, well beyond when they are effective in killing the mite. The most common types of pesticides found in beehives include some of these early treatments for varroa, but the USDA have found more than 120 pesticides in wax, pollen, and bees. Many of the new class of chemicals are far more environmentally friendly than some of the old class of chemicals that we experienced back in the 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, such as chlorinated hydrocarbons, carbamates, and organophosphates. These are very toxic to bees, and massive numbers of dead bees would be common for beekeepers in coming into their bee yards. Some of the newer classes of chemicals, known as the neonicotinoids, are by far more environmentally safer than some of these older classes I just mentioned. Neonicotinoids, or neonics, are one particular type of pesticide that has recently been targeted by some as a potential cause of CCD. This class of chemicals works like nicotine and affects the acetylcholinesterase receptors. They are very effective on piercing sucking insects and have very low mammalian toxicity. Neonics can be applied as sprays, drenches, or a seed treatment. The pesticide is absorbed by the plant and translocates through the plant both in the xylem and the phloem. When a bug sucks the juices of the plant, they can get a lethal dose. While this makes neonics safer from an environmental perspective, it is also a problem for bees, as the pesticide can be found in both the pollen and the nectar of the plant. In laboratory settings, neonicotinoids have been shown to have sublethal effects on honeybees at levels as low as 0.2 parts per billion. These effects include altering learning behavior, movement, memory, reproduction, foraging activity, ability to taste, and overall activity. So, laboratory experiments tell us that neonics are not good for bees, but in those experiments, bees are given no choice but to accept sugar syrup laced with a pesticide being tested. In theory, many pesticides can kill or harm bees, but tests done in the laboratory where bees are fed a known concentration of pesticides does not mean that they would experience similar effects in the field. How much are bees actually being exposed to neonics? Recently, 149 Washington apiaries were surveyed to answer this question. We were interested in understanding what likely residues of a class of insecticides called neonicotinoids that have been a lot of concern, how much were out there in the environment that bees might be exposed to. So 
when you do these kinds of studies, they're called exposure studies, and they're types of experiments. So the study was designed to look at potential exposures of bees in ideally pollen, but we went a step further where they've already eaten the pollen and then regurgitated as bee bread that becomes the food for the larvae in the colony. So we were looking at potential of pesticide residues, the neonicotinoid insecticides, to be in the bee bread. A key element of the experiment was to look at how landscape might influence the detection of those insecticide residues. So a number of different apiaries were visited, commercial pollination type service apiaries. We uh, looked at those in agricultural landscapes. We also looked at some smaller apiaries, maybe more hobbyist type apiaries in rural landscapes and in urban landscapes. And bee bread was collected from comb in those various landscapes. We were able to detect neonicotinoid insecticides in some of the bee bread samples. We detected very little in wax samples. But in the bee bread samples where we detected it, we mostly detected in agricultural settings, and those were influenced by commercial pollination surface apiaries. We detected very little in bee bread from landscapes that we classified as rural or urban. The amounts of insecticide residues that we detected are considered, when one examines what we know from the published literature, to be very low and very unlikely to cause any problem for the bees. When you do an experiment to measure the potential exposure of bees to pesticides, one has to keep in mind that the bees are foraging on a lot of different food sources. In our studies, we don't know exactly what they're foraging on. We only know what's in the area of where their apiary is from where they're coming. So when we looked at the four most important neonicotinoid insecticides that are considered the most toxic, we are not surprised that we found low levels of them. And we're not surprised that when we did find them, we found them mostly in agricultural types of landscapes. When bees leave the apiary to go out foraging for food, they're foraging on a landscape that is mostly not treated. These insecticides are not put everywhere in a landscape. So when they're bringing back food to the colony, most of the food will not have insecticide residues on it. So we think that our data shows very well that there is very low levels of insecticides when we can detect them. So we know neonicotinoids are not good for bees, but how you use them and where you use them and when you use them are all important variables in terms of protecting honeybees and other pollinators. So when using any insecticide or any pesticide, read and follow the label. In some of the new labels that the EPA is putting out, there's a new emblem that will identify the hazard and potential hazards that this may have for bees and other pollinators. Make sure you follow the directions explicitly and do things that will avoid contact with bees. When making application of insecticide or really any pesticide, there are a few things that you can do to really help honeybees and other pollinators. Don't spray when there are blooms present. Don't spray when you see bees in the area. Not only look at the plant that you're spraying, but also look at the ground for other types of flowering plants, such as dandelions or clover, where the drift may fall down onto those plants and then be transmitted back to the colony and causing problems. Water can also be a major problem. A lot of people don't realize the demand for bees have for water to control both the humidity and the temperature of the colony. So getting pesticide drift onto standing water can be a major problem for honeybees. The other thing that you might be able to do is spray at night or early in the morning prior to the bees actually flying. Once the product has dried, its toxicity to bees is greatly reduced. So spraying and letting it dry before bees are present can really help reduce the impact that you have on bees. Besides being careful to protect bees from pesticide exposures, what else can we do to help bees? 
Many beekeepers rely on supplemental feed in order to help the bees make it through dearth periods. What we know is that bees do much better when there is a plentiful supply of natural nectar and pollen coming into the colony. Not only does it help them nutritionally, but there are also some aspects that helps turn on the natural defenses that the bees have when they consume natural nectar and pollen. One of the most important things you can do is to plant flowers, planting lots of flowers. There are a variety of flowers, both native plants and eco-appropriate plants that really do well without any insecticide or pesticide needed to apply. Such things as lavender, chive, oregano, thyme are all plants that can do well and thrive very effectively and bees love them and don't require a lot of maintenance or pesticides in order to keep them healthy and growing in your garden. So from the homeowner or from the landscaper recommending that their customers plant more flowers may not only be a good thing for bees but may be good for your bottom line in terms of what you can provide. Let's think about native bees too. We know that they're important for pollination. We should consider their biology when creating habitat. So there's about 4,000 species of native bees in the United States alone, and they contribute up to $3 million or more um, in pollination services to the economy of the United States. Um, many species people are probably familiar with, such as bumblebees, um, are one common group of native bees. But most of them, unlike bumblebees and, their, and honeybees, um, actually nest as solitary species. So they do not form large colonies like honeybees um, and bumblebees to a lesser extent. Um, but it's single females that are creating nests um, and provisioning that nest with eggs, um, nectar, and pollen um, where they grow their offspring. So these native bees are very important for the pollination of many crops, um, including um, berry crops, tree fruits, um, and melons. Um, and they can provide really complementary services to honeybees in many cases, and in some instances um, do a better job of pollinating than honeybees. So, Many of the native bee species will either nest in the ground, about 70% of them form nests in patches of bare earth or sand um, where they rear their offspring and come out of those nests to pollinate crops. Um, and about the remaining 30% of species um, will nest in twigs, branches, um, holes that insects create in trees um, and come out and pollinate. So these species are present throughout the year and are very important for pollination of many crops. Um, and research has shown that if they're present on your farm, um, up to, in some cases they can completely re replace honeybees, and in others will just complement honeybees to give you a more effective uh, pollination services. So having a diversity of flowering plants is really important on the garden or farm for native bees. Um, and when I mention diversity, Things that are important to consider are having plants that are blooming throughout the year, um, spring plants, summer plants, and fall to support species and have a stable community throughout the year. It's also important to have a diversity of colors um, and shapes because different colors will attract different species as well as different shapes. Um, one of the most important things as well that has been shown to promote native bees is to, prom is to plant flowers in patches. So having large clumps with multiple colors and shapes can attract bees from long distances and then those bees can spill out and pollinate other crops. Whereas if you're planting flowers patchily throughout the farm or garden, um, it has been shown to be a little bit less effective at drawing in bees um, and providing those important nectar and pollen resources. Other things that you can do to promote native bees is to reduce um, the use of mulches or ground cover for weeds because of the species that ground, are ground nesting that can disturb their ability to get in and out of their nests. Um, so having habitat where you just have bare earth or sandy patches that are relatively undisturbed can be incredibly important for having a diversity of ground nesting species um, on the farm or home garden. It's important to consider to use locally sourced plants. Um, locally sourced plants that are native to the area where your home or garden is have been shown to be four or more times more effective at attracting native bees and providing those important pollen and nectar resources um, than plants that are not native to the region. So whenever considering to put in flowering plants for native bees, it's important to consider species that grow in your area, native to your area, um, local seed suppliers or flower shops or gardening stores um, can provide advice on the right types of flowers for your region. 
Hi, I'm the nurseryman and uh, garden center owner. So I design gardens. One of my favorites is put in hummingbird garden and also the garden that uh, uh, attract bees. So here are some of the, the, the plants that the bee like, but I do feel uh, one good advice to ensure that you have a good collection of plants with biodiversity. So the bees have uh, what they, they need from the spring all the way to the frost. For example, from the beginning of the year, you could have chives uh, and those kind of things. And in the middle season, you can have salvia, lupin, a uh, hot poker plant and even the bee balm, uh, of course. So if you collect these plants and then keep the bee, uh, bees busy, then uh, they all kind of benefits well will happen. One of the most important things that we can all do is to protect existing natural habitat. Both native and non-invasive flowering plants are critically important for all types of pollinators and other beneficial insects. In the grower situation, having a diversity of flowers we know helps stimulate bees to go out and gather more pollen, gather no more nectar. This helps not only honeybees, but also native bees. Research has demonstrated that by having a diversity of flowers actually can help stimulate the bees and get better fruit set. We also know that a competition between native bees and honeybees will help improve the, fr the fruit set. So having that diversity of not only flowers, but also diversity of bees helps produce better fruit and better fruit crops. Some growers provide bee habitat within their orchard or crop and encourage others to do the same. When we're not pollinating, we really don't have a lot of locations that has good forage for the bees. Uh, one thing that you can see here in the middle of my uh, cherry orchard, we I plant alfalfa and clover in all of my orchards and I let it bloom in the summertime and it's fantastic what it does uh, for the bees. Our best honey yards are right here in my own orchards and uh, uh, I wish that everyone would do this to provide more habitat for the bees. Uh, this works very, very, very well. Well, all homeowners and, and everyone can add to the bee habitat by planting flowers that are bee friendly and that have uh, good nectar and good pollen uh, in them. Uh, uh, now, uh, south of my orchard here are a lot of farmettes and I love those farmettes because they have alfalfa that's in there and keeps blooming, they have all kinds of clover that's in there. Any plants that bloom are wonderful for the bees. If you can get a diversity of plants, it's much healthier for the bees. There's a lot of effort to get growers in ground that they can let go to bee-friendly forage for them to do that. Mass spraying of broad spectrum herbicides kill not only the target noxious weed, but also a broad array of beneficial plants. In the control of noxious weeds, we'll often go in with a broad spectrum herbicide to wipe out the noxious weed that we're after. And then we'll go in for planting grass seed in order to facilitate erosion control. But the problem with grass seed is that it provides nothing to the native pollinators and it really helps choke out some of the, the dicots, the native uh, plants that bees rely on. So going in and getting a mix of flowering plants that will come in not only helps reduce the possibility of noxious weeds coming back in and colonizing the area, but it really helps promote pollination and pollinator protection. Honeybees are important for our nutrition, the environment, and the economy. We know that honeybees are affected by many factors that reduce their colony strength, such as varroa mite, loss of habitat, stress, and pesticide exposure. What are WSU researchers doing to improve colony health by increasing tolerance to varroa mite? Honeybees were introduced into the U.S. by early settlers between the 1600s and 1800s. And in 1922, there was a ban on importation to prevent the introduction of tracheomites, which we now have. But um, because of this, you have a small subset sampling of honeybees introduced to the U.S. And uh, of the 28 subspecies, we have two recognizable ones in the U.S. here, um, Italians and Carniolans. So we have a project with um, Washington State University to import germplasm to diversify the U.S. gene pool um, in the thought that the more diversity we have, the more ability to, to do selection against pests and parasites. 
diseases, pathogens, things like that. Because you have, you have a small industry here, basically made up of about, the, the commercial queen producers basically work with about 500 queen mothers to produce a million and a half honeybee queens to supply the industry. Um, and it's a, it's a small gene pool. So we, we're bringing in germplasm, basically honeybee semen, um, and working very closely with the queen producers to diversify their breeding stock, hoping that we can, this will help with selection against varroa and pathogens and things of that nature. You know, one of the greatest challenges facing beekeepers, uh, and it's been since the late 1980s, is the varroa mite. And this is a mite that's a, a normal, you know, good parasite on another species of honeybee that lives in Southeast Asia. But on our Western honeybee, it normally kills the colony within a couple of years without beekeeper intervention. So for a number of years, beekeepers have been able to stay ahead of this mite by uh, applying miticides within the beehive uh, to control the mite. But the mite with its fast reproductive ability, you know, short generation time, has been able to develop resistance to most of the compounds that beekeepers have used. So the long-term sort of sustainable solution, we believe, is through breeding, breeding honeybees that are more tolerant of this mite. They can kind of coexist with it a little bit better. And so um, one of the traits we select for is also varroa tolerance. We don't have the idea that we're going to go out and you know find a silver bullet and bring it back and then everyone will have that because uh, the honeybees we have in this country have been selected for you know a hundred years or more for traits beekeepers need and for the sort of agricultural system we have but what we want to do is bring in additional genetic diversity and then from that diversity to select for the traits uh, including varroa resistance we're also um, conducting other research related to uh, control of this parasite, including using some um, fungal extracts or, or actually growing fungi themselves that, uh, that have uh, uh, anti-mite properties. And we're evaluating metabolic gas uh, treatments, which is basically allowing the CO2 levels in controlled atmosphere chambers where the bees can be stored for the winter to rise to a level that, that perhaps harms the mites but doesn't harm the bees. We've, we've done research to show that honeybees can tolerate fairly high levels of CO2 um, in controlled atmosphere chambers. So in the winter time inside the hive, you know, when there's 20 below or there's snow outside, the bees are in a tight cluster and within that cluster they um, allow, you know, the CO2 levels to go up to about six percent or so and you know it's much less than half a percent normally in the air we're breathing and we know that elevated co2 reduces metabolic rate so one thought was uh, perhaps in these controlled atmosphere storage facilities we could raise the co2 and kind of reduce the metabolic rate of the bee uh, and then an added benefit may be that this is uh, harmful to the mites. So in the winter cluster, you know, the mites are not reproducing. They're, they're clinging to the bees because the mites only reproduce in the brood. And in the middle of winter and in these controlled atmosphere or winter storage facilities, the, mite, the bees are not reproducing, so they don't have brood. So the mites are kind of hanging on for dear life, really. And if we can raise the CO2 level to a, a level that causes them to die and the bees are still alive. That would be a way that the beekeepers uh, with just in their winter storage could come out with uh, mite-free bees. So that's some of the research we're also doing. That's a yellow jacket, I'll bet. Anyway, not a honeybee. <laughs> As we just heard, the WSU Honey Bee Health Program is working to increase genetic diversity for varroa mite tolerance. They're also conducting research to improve pollination services. What you see here are nucleus colonies all filled with uh, queens that have been inseminated with uh, semen from Apis mellifera pomenella, which is a honeybee from the Tian Shan Mountains, which is the homeland of apples. And what we've done is uh, go to the, go to, uh, the Tian Shan Mountains 
and uh, collect semen from this subspecies of honeybee and uh, we are able to bring it back through permit. This is our uh, quarantine uh, apiary here for, for the USDA APHIS and this material has just been released. So we'll use it in our breeding program uh, where we're developing honeybees that are uh, well adapted to Washington state conditions, especially in this area, you know, rather uh, cold conditions and that are uh, hopefully a better apple pollinator. That's the goal with this particular subspecies. Since about 2008, we've been bringing semen in for our breeding program under permit and including the subspecies that, that are mostly used by commercial beekeepers in the United States. And the rationale is to increase the pool of genetic diversity we have for breeding. And so this material, we bring it in, we, uh, we evaluate it for a couple of years, and then we move it into the U.S. honeybee population through commercial uh, queen producers uh, that we supply queens to. So uh, one of the reasons that we brought in this uh, subspecies from the Tian Shan Mountains, the, from the homeland of apples, is um, sometimes cherry producers and apple producers have difficulty getting effective pollination in cold, rainy springs. And the thought is that this honeybee, from, from some very uh, substantial mountains in Central Asia, where these um, trees, actually this entire group of uh, fruit developed, uh, would be uh, well adapted for these sort of colder pollinating conditions. And uh, beginning this fall, we'll actually be evaluating some of these different strains of honeybees uh, in tree fruits and almonds and other uh, agricultural systems to kind of evaluate their, and compare their foraging behavior. So that, that all fits into our breeding pro program where we're also selecting for resistance to diseases, uh, overwintering ability, honey production, gentleness, uh, traits that beekeepers are interested in. So what techniques are being developed to accelerate results from this research? So one of the projects we do here at WSU is maintain the world's first germplasm repository for honeybees. And we have a few different subspecies um, preserved in this tank here that we've collected from Italy, uh, the Republic of Georgia in the Caucasus Mountains, the um, Tian Shan Mountains in Kazakhstan, and the Alps region in Slovenia. Since they had that law that banned importation of honeybees, we can't bring in queens uh, to bolster the genetic diversity of the U.S. breeding populations. The only thing we're allowed to do is bring in honeybee semen, and that's only recently under a uh, permit from the USDA APHIS, and so it's under tight regulation. We send aliquots of the semen to be screened for viruses, and only after that's been processed and we get notification from APHIS are we allowed to release these inseminated queens from quarantine and then work with commercial queen producers to introduce this uh, new genetics into the main breeding population in the United States. Uh, one thing that makes it unique is our ability to hold this semen in liquid nitrogen and still be able to use it year after year. So. Uh, before we had this process, we'd bring in fresh semen and then inseminate queens, but then we'd, it's a one-time thing, and then to get more semen, we'd have to go back to that area or that region or country to get more semen, because every daughter after that would be continually diluted with the domestic stock here in the U.S. So you'd end up with daughters that are 50% the imported stock, and then their mating would re result in daughters that are then 25 percent and then 12 and a half percent and so on and so on. So but with frozen semen with a single trip to that country or region to collect that subspecies we then have this frozen stock that every year we can thaw samples and inseminate queens so instead of instead of serial dilutions of the genetics we can um, sequentially do back crosses and increase the purity of that particular subspecies. So 50% initially, then frozen semen, then it's 75%, then frozen semen, 82%, frozen semen, 87%, continually until you get to 99.99% .99 pure.
pure stock, all using frozen semen from a single collection. So it provides a huge advantage in that aspect and allows us to um, spread this genetics to a greater portion of the U.S. breeding population. There are a lot of things that we can do to help protect bees. Reading the label and following the, those directions explicitly, making sure that we make smart applications, avoid spraying when bees are present, avoid drifts on the areas where bees will get that contaminant back into the colony and cause problems. Those are all simple things we can do. Just think about it in advance and plan your, your spray applications accordingly. And then planting flowers. That's something everyone can do. You don't have to become a beekeeper to save bees, but we should be out there planting as many flowers and making as much habitat as we possibly can, both in urban settings and in rural settings. Having vast areas where bees are able to bring in pollen and nectar, where the beekeepers can take their bees for respites in order to ensure that when they're ready for pollination, they're ready for pollination. No matter how big or how small you are, all of us can do something to help protect bees and to ensure they'll be here for generations to come. Do your part, we can all do this together. <laughs>